All right, we're going to um, get started. Um, so welcome. I'm going to uh, introduce myself as folks are sitting down. And by then, um, hopefully when you hear about the panelists, it'll be quiet. Um, I'm Ilmi Granoff. Uh, I am a uh, senior visiting fellow at the Grantham Research Institute at LSE and a uh, adjunct research scholar at uh, Columbia Law School. Um, and um, uh, I have the delight of uh, chairing this panel on financing the transition. Um, and uh, for those of you who have not uh, uh, heard me chair or moderate a panel before, my intention is to uh, be a lively and uh, active uh, moderator. So I have posed a set of questions already to give them fair warning to the panelists about 24 hours ago so that they could think about them. I will um, definitely participate in the Q&A and discussion, which we'll do after each of the panel uh, presentations. Uh, so far uh, in the sessions this morning, um, you all have been very active. So I'm looking forward to that continuing and welcome uh, questions and comments as long as they are short. Um, the principle I'd like you to follow if you are uh, raising your hand to speak is to imagine that you have a match that is lit in your finger, <laughs> and uh, you should not get burned by that match while you're still talking. So try to put that image in your mind as you stand up and make a comment, um, uh, and hopefully that'll move things along. Um, the theme is financing the transition, and I think I'd like to kind of frame it up as follow to think of it as follows. Is, the role of um, the financial markets in the transition um, is both that it can respond to the nature of the low carbon transition and the transition to a net zero economy in ways that may accelerate or retard that transformation. And we want to kind of understand that better. And also, financing that transition may actually have a role in accelerating it. And so understanding what function, not just financing as funding, like how we allocate a bunch of stuff uh, of financial capital to transition, but how financing as a function might actually accelerate the, the, the rate of change. So I think that's sort of the theme. We have three really interesting topics, and I'll introduce our panelists. Um, farthest from me is Elisa klein Ehenhus. klein Ehenhus. OK. Um, thank you. Um, who's a research scholar at Stanford's um, Institute of Economic Policy Research and a research associate at the Oxford Martin School's uh, Institute for New Economic Thinking. Um, closest to me is uh, Carol Kempa, who's a postdoc and lecturer uh, in the Econ Department of the Frankfurt School of Finance and Management, and also a researcher at the Frankfurt School's UNEP Collaboration Center for Climate and Sustainable Energy Finance. And in the middle, a little bit easier Dutch name, uh, Ralph de Haas. Uh, who's a director of research at EBRD and is also a, a part-time professor at KU Leuven, a research fellow at CEPR, uh, and a fellow at the European Bank Center, and also a research associate um, at the Zoo Leibniz Center for Euro uh, European Banking, um, and um, like me, has too many hats. Um, <laughs> and um, with that, we will start with Elisa's um, presentation on the great carbon arbitrage. Thank you, Ilmi. You're welcome. Thank you so much for uh, the organizers at Yale to include uh, the great carbon arbitrage in your program. This is joint work with Tobias Adrian from the IMF and Patrick Bolton from Imperial. And I should say that the views expressed in this presentation are those of the authors and do not necessarily represent the views of the IMF, its management, or its directors. At COP26, two distinct discussions took place. One was the discussion to end coal. The other was the discussion to provide 100 billion of climate finance every year for developing countries. Now, at COP27, and beyond, we argue that those two discussions should be merged. The great carbon arbitrage. So when it comes to internalizing negative externalities, economists have taken two different approaches. One is associated with PIGU and seeks to use taxation or the pricing of social harm 
to fully reflect the social cost of an economic activity. The other is associated with cost and seeks to attain an efficient social outcome through bargaining and contracting. So we build on this literature here uh, by giving a quantitative estimate of the social surplus that can be attained from avoiding emissions. The question we ask is how much would the world benefit from phasing out fossil fuels and replacing them with energy from renewable sources such as wind, power and solar radiation. We focus on quantifying the gains from phasing out coal. The focus on coal is natural since it's the most polluting fossil fuels. On this basis alone, it makes sense to focus our attention on, uh, on ending coal. And indeed, a cost-benefit analysis would indicate it's most economically efficient to begin the energy transition with this. Indeed, under a cohesion bargain, coal companies would be compensated for the losses they incur from seizing their operations. And the social benefits from avoided emissions would be assessed net both of the opportunity cost of coal and the capital expenditures required to install replacement renewable energy. Gross societal benefits from avoided emissions are me measured by the average social cost of carbon times the quantity of avoided emissions. Indeed, if an efficient global emissions trading system were to be in place, uh, the equilibrium carbon price in this market would be equal to the applicable marginal social cost of carbon. And it would then be possible to reap a total gross revenue from phasing out coal equal to the average carbon price times the total quantity of avoided emissions. Shorting coal and going long renewables would then result in a net gain, or in other words, carbon arbitrage. In this paper, we make use of probably the most granular data set on coal production in the world. It has information on coal production in tons of coal annually at the plant level, as well as information on the emission intensity of each plant, capturing both its scope one and scope three emissions, and hence capturing all the emissions in the value chain. It doesn't capture scope two, which is very small compared to the other types of emissions. So when we aggregate coal production at the plant level to the global level, we find that the global coal production is very comparable to the estimates of other authoritative sources such as the International Energy Agency and likewise for emissions. This gives us confidence that we can indeed rely on our data. So the question is how fast can we feasibly phase out coal? So the red line in the left shows the historical coal production aggregated to the global level. And the blue line shows a scenario by the Network for Greening the Financial System of what coal production would look like under business as usual. Now, of course, ideally, we'd like to end coal today. That's probably not going to be feasible. What might be feasible is to phase it out according to projections, again, in line with those of the International Energy Agency and also the Network for Greening the Financial System on how to get to net zero by 2050 uh, uh, in, in time. And you see that on the orange line, and indeed still by 2050, there's a still positive amount of coal production left. So there will have to be reliance on net zero uh, negative emissions. So the difference between the blue and the orange line gives you then the amount of coal production that has to be reduced every year. And since we know only the emission intensity in 2020 and we assume it stays constant over time, you get a proportional amount of emission reductions going forward. So let's turn to the uh, methodology. Very simply, the carbon arbitrage is given by the positive difference of the present value of the benefits of avoiding carbon emissions minus the present value of the cost of doing so, taking into account both the opportunity cost of coal and the investment cost in renewable energy. So this is the equation one, which basically says the benefits minus the cost is the net difference, where we are starting in 2022, ending at the end of the century 2100, that's capital T. S1 is the business as usual scenario. S2 is a scenario at which you're going uh, you're gonna to use to phase out coal, which is the net zero 2050 scenario, and theta is the social cost of carbon. So to start with, we're going to focus on estimating the global carbon arbitrage uh, um, as the world as a whole. So let's break this down. What are the benefits of avoided emissions? Well, it's really the avoided climate damages globally, the avoided adaptation costs. How do we measure that? Well, it's the total emissions that we avoid 
at the company level when we aggregate across time over this century and across all the companies in the world. And now, how do we price what, how many damages are avoided if we're not just going one ton away from business as usual, but we're going multiple gigatons away from business as usual? So if you're an environmental economist, you know that uh, carbon taxes should be priced at the social cost of carbon, which tells you what the extra damage is from putting one extra ton of CO2 into the atmosphere. Or conversely, what the avoided damage is if you do not put that ton into the atmosphere. But now we're going to go multiple gigatons down. So how do we price this? Any volunteers? <laughs> OK, well, I'm hoping to give you the answer in the next slide. So we know that as emissions are built up cumulatively in the atmosphere, the greenhouse effect is going to get more powerful. So um, we cannot just use the marginal social cost of carbon. We need to capture every ton that we go down, how the damage from that extra of emission reduction will actually decrease somehow a little bit. So this is what uh, uh, Robert Pindyke from MIT has done. He basically asked, you know, what would be the damages under business as usual? How many damages can we avoid if we go down to net zero 2050? And on average, what is the marginal social cost of carbon that applies? So that is, in essence, the integral under the curve, right? So this gives us an estimate of the avoided damages globally if we uh, uh, phase out coal according to net zero 2050. So then... The next question is, what are the costs? So, as I said, the costs consist first of the investment costs in renewables. Um, and many have told me, you should indeed also take into consideration the investment costs to build short and long duration storage capacity because renewables are intermittent. So you need to be able to have dispatchable uh, energy that you can release when necessary or can absorb when, when necessary. And you may have to extend the grid. And of course, you want to make sure that it's a just transition that was referred to earlier. So you want to make sure you compensate those that are left behind, the coal communities. At a minimum, the opportunity cost of coal consists of the missed free cash flows, discounted back to today, that coal owners no longer uh, earn. But of course, the coal communities are broader. So we've recently incorporated also the first quantitative estimate of the avoided, um, the, the compensation that one could offer to coal workers that lose their jobs, and the compensation that could, should be offered to help retrain those for employment in the renewable energy sector. Um, so this is what we do. There's a model for how we estimate this, but let me just say it's the first quantitative estimate based on quantitative data globally at a granular level to get here. I'm not going to show you, but you, will, you can read the paper if you want to know more. So turning to the results. So we want to know what is the net gain that can be reaped from replacing coal with renewables. And the standard uh, set of parameters that we use uh, to get a conservative estimate of this is as follows. We're using the average social cost of carbon of $80 per ton of CO2. That's the lower end estimate by the Pindyke study. It could be much higher. We're phasing out coal over the course of this century according to a net zero 2050 scenario. And as a default, we're going to say we're replacing coal with a mixture of solar and wind, 50% of each. And we're assuming that the renewable lifetime for um, uh, solar and, and wind farms is 30 years. Um, and we're discounting uh, future investment costs in <coughs> renewables, in battery storage, in, in the opportunity cost of coal at the weighted average cost of capital. Um, OK. So now I'm going to do a little poll with you. I'm sorry that I'm again putting you on the spot. Um, uh, and the reason I'm doing this poll is to get a sense of whether you're aware of what the magnitudes of these types of numbers are. So first of all, how many gigatons of coal do you think we can avoid if we phase out coal from business as usual according to this net zero scenario that, we just, uh, that I just showed you on the slide? So I want to see hands up for A. Hands up for B. Okay, hands up for C. Hands up for D. OK, so please remember your answer. Write it down. Next one. So if we phase out coal with this quantity of avoided emissions in gigatons that you just put in your mind, what are globally the avoided climate damages that you think we can achieve? 
Hands up for A. Hands up for B. Hands up for C. <coughs> Hands up for D. Uh, yes? Hands up for E. Hands up for F. Great. Remember that, uh, that answer. So now, the next question is, OK, we've, you've put in your mind an answer of what the benefits might be if you take into account globally avoided emissions price at the average social cost of carbon. What are the investment costs you think we need to make globally in present value terms to build sufficient renewables to replace coal and we don't get an energy shortage? So every time we replace, phase out coal, we're going to replace it with an equal amount of renewable uh, energy capacity. So what do you think it costs? A, answers. Hands up for B. Hands up for C. Hands up for D. And now if you take into co consideration also the complementary costs in storage. Hands up for A, what do you think that costs? Short and, and long term storage. Hands up for B. Hands up for C. Hands up for D. OK, great. So final question, and then I will ask you to do the computation. <laughs> Which is, what do you think the opportunity costs of coal are? So how much do we have to pay globally to compensate coal communities that are now going to be left behind because we switched to renewables? Hands up for A. Hands up for B. Hands up for C. Hands up for D. Hands up for E. OK, thank you. Well, first of all, I saw a wide a disagreement <laughs> as to what the costs are of, of this and what the benefits are. So if you remembered your answer, <coughs> you're now able to compute what the net gain is, according to you, of replacing coal with renewables. It's the avoided climate damages minus the investment costs minus the opportunity costs. So if you wrote it down, please do the calculation and come to your answer. Now let me tell you, if you actually do this based on the most granular data set in the world, using conservative estimate of what all of this costs, so on the high end, what we end up with. So the present value of the benefits of phasing out coal, so the avoided climate damages, is 114 trillion. Under a conservative estimate, could be more. The lion's share of the investment cost, uh, the cost side, comes from building a, a renewable energy capacity. And all, only a small part consists of compensating for the opportunity cost of coal when you capture the missed uh, free cash flows. If you do a broader definition of investment cost where you, and opportunity cost of coal where you compensate coal communities globally, you get that you have to pay out uh, $275 billion in present value terms to compensate for lost wages, $7 billion to, to help uh, pay for the retraining costs, and the extra investment costs in short and long-term storage are $7 trillion. And by the way, to, your, to the first question, what are, is the total quantity of emissions that we avoid if we phase out coal? It's 1,425 gigatons. So, you know, there is this huge free lunch that we can pick up. It's there to pick up on the table. And the question is, why hasn't this free lunch been taken? Now, the first answer we give is maybe policymakers were just not aware. In fact, if I looked at all your answers, you were not aware. So this is the first study that doesn't look at a one-ton uh, deviation from business as usual, with, which all the integrated assessment models uh, focus on. This is a study that looks at the total net benefits that can be reaped. And indeed, when I talked to fiscal policymakers uh, at the European Central Bank that all came together, and also when I, um, you know, there was a Dutch newspaper article in a leading Dutch newspaper, where basically all of them and these fiscal policymakers said, um, we indeed can you know, focus on computing the mitigation costs of different mitigation strategies, but they never focus on what the benefits might be of, such, uh, of, of any type of climate mitigation action. So, so what we want to do in this paper is really say, please be aware there is this big net gain. And what I will get to next is how can we reap this net gain? How can we turn it from hypothetical, theoretical to real? So very quickly, we uh, provide the first quantitative estimates of climate finance to replace coal with renewables across the world. Lion share is in emerging market economies. We can break down how much should be provided on an annual basis to make this happen globally. You can all download this, by the way, from our website, greatcarbonarbitrage.com. And we find that the, the 
country that needs most finance to replace coal with renewables, not surprisingly, is China. But actually, when you look at that in terms of percentage of GDP, it's the poorer countries that are most in need of financing to replace coal with renewables, including South Africa. So, so we've established that there's this huge net gain. Um, and you know, one way to get that is carbon taxation, right? This is widely considered to be first best, but it relies on an approach of, of sticks. It's politically very hard to get done. There are lots of papers in the finance literature focusing on cost of capital effects. They're currently not large enough to really trigger the transition. So what we argue is that in a world of incomplete carbon taxation, it may make sense to get, rely on complementary policies to get to net zero in time. And a promising uh, such policy is climate finance. So in essence, what Co says is you can pay the polluter to stop polluting, and that makes economic sense if that makes you better off. And we just showed globally that makes you better off. So what we should strive for, we should double down efforts for a global deal to end coal. Now, I see you thinking, surely this is bound to fail, right? We have not picked up this free lunch yet. It's never going to happen. So question to you. Give me some good reasons why is this bound to fail. Um, I'm going to point out, um, Tom, you're a very smart guy. Please give an answer. <laughs> Okay, is there another volunteer that wants to give an answer why you're sure this is bound to fail? People hate things that aren't fair. So what you're doing here is you're paying out the coal industry executives, people who work in coal, to Okay, any other uh, reasons why this is bound to fail? Fantastic. Yes, that's where I will get to. OK, so now let me lay out why I think actually we can strive to work towards this global and why it can work. And Alex? Yeah, very, yeah, very yeah. brief. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll stop. <laughs> um, so first of all, I broke down the costs and how they are different globally to get rid of coal. And I computed the global benefit, but clearly the benefits are unevenly distributed because in some areas, climate impacts will be bigger than others. So what you can do is you can apply the global emissions reductions to the country level social cost of carbon to get an estimate of how each country will be made better off. So what do you get? You get that actually, if you do this, if you assume each country will as a baseline in the cohesion bargain, pay for its own cost of replacing coal with renewables, that doing, paying that cost is smaller than the benefits that they receive. So even in absence of cross-country uh, transitory um, compensatory transfers, it's already in the interest of, of the majority of countries to partake in this cohesion deal. And what they could do based on equity consideration, because maybe the, you know, the West has polluted more, is wealthier, they could pay the poorer countries to do this. Well, then the question is, you know, it's been so hard to get this development uh, climate finance going. Equity considerations are really important, but they're not a strong impetus for action. The question is, you know, who pays for climate finance? So what I show in this paper is actually that, uh, that um, uh, providing climate finance to developing countries is not just equitable. It is in many cases self-interest. So what do we do? For example, take a look at Africa. You know, there are certain costs that it would have to pay to get finance that you would have to provide to get it to decarbonize. And there are benefits to Africa if it alone faced out coal. And there would be greater benefits to Africa if there was a global deal because there were more, would be more emission reductions. But the emission reductions that Africa achieves if it faced out coal have co-benefits for other regions because the climate damages in other regions will be less. And you can compute what, that, what those are <coughs> by basically saying what are the total emission reductions of Africa multiplied with the social cost of carbon that applies to these other regions to get an estimate of that. And what do you see? There, there are huge benefits to other regions. So they are made better off paying the polluter Africa to stop polluting. It's not just equitable to help Africa decarbonize. It is self-interest. Maybe, you know, it, as I said, it's not possible in a cohesion bargain to get the whole world on the table. You know, there are high transaction costs and so on. So it may be more feasible to strike smaller deals, ideally a regional deal um, or even country deals. 
And here I plot, and then I will conclude, um, with one extra slide I will conclude, the um, costs to get the top nine coal polluters to stop, pollute, uh, to stop producing coal and replace that with renewables. So the x-axis are the costs, the y-axis are their benefits. And again, we show that there are huge benefits to other countries to pay, let's say, a China, to pay a South Africa, to pay an, uh, in Indonesia to stop polluting. So the, the essence is that ideally you strike this global deal to phase out coal. But doing it at once might be hard. But we can get there in blocks. And let's focus on the biggest bang for bucks first. You're going to first strike financing deals to get the top nine coal producing countries to stop polluting, to phase out coal, replace it with renewables. And this is actually the, some of the progress that we saw at COP27 this week. So here I'm plotting for you the benefits and costs of getting Indonesia to decarbonize. So what happened in this deal? Essentially, 20 billion was provided. Blended climate finance, which is what we propose, you want to rely <coughs> as much as possible on capital markets to do this. Half of it by public institutions via multilateral development banks, half of it by the capital markets. Um, and this financing was provided to help build renewables conditional on the commitment to phase out coal. Why is that conditionality important? Otherwise, you don't get emission reduction. So you want to make sure you're phasing renewables concurrently with phasing out coal, such that overall energy supply remains intact, and you don't get large carbon leakage. So if you don't have a global deal, you must set up conditional climate finance to limit this carbon leakage. So what are the costs to get um, uh, Indonesia completely to phase out coal. It's quite a lot more than the, the financing that's currently provided, but this is over the course of the century. What are the benefits to Indonesia? You can see it there. And then what I plot on the left is what the benefits are to the fi financiers that made this deal possible. So who paid for the Indonesian deal? It was Japan, America, and the other G7 countries. So you know this was part of the Indonesia Just Energy Transition Partnership. And it was made primarily also because it's equitable. But what we say is the financiers actually provided money and it was self-interest. Paying the polluter to stop polluting as causes inside was can make you better off. So to conclude, we estimate that there's this huge net gain from being able to replace coal with renewables. To reap this net gain, and as a complement to incomplete carbon taxation, we propose climate finance to replace coal with renewables. We quantify how much climate finance would be needed across all countries of the world. And you must make sure that this financing for renewables is conditional on the commitment to, to phase out coal. And to make it equitable, you have to uh, pay for the opportunity cost of coal. We propose blended finance to draw as much as mon possible money from public uh, capital markets. And if you structure this in an asset-backed security deal where the public institutions take the equity trench, you actually increase the supply massively of ESG assets that if you invest in it, actually bring down emissions. They help to mitigate climate change because every time you invest in that, it uh, results in <coughs> further renewable build-out and, a, and an, uh, a reduction in coal production. We break down what the costs and benefits are across the world. And the key, I guess, theoretical insight is that COAST provides a new perspective on a rationale for or a foundation for climate finance. And importantly, we show that tangible net benefits can be reaped even if only a coalition of the willing strikes a cohesion deal to phase out coal. So we can start with focusing on the top nine coal producers. And I did the cal calculation. Out of the 1,400 gigaton we can avoid globally by phasing out coal, 1,200 gigatons are from the top nine. So in a Voxy U podcast that just got online today with Patrick Bolton, Patrick said, there is value to focus. Where should we focus? The low hanging lowest hanging fruit, coal. Where should we focus? In the countries where coal production, uh, coal emissions are most pronounced, the top nine. So in sum, the big picture contribution is that we uh, conceptually can pay the polluter to stop polluting. And the empirical contribution is that we provide the first quantification of climate finance to end coal uh, across the world. So I hope that this presentation 
can give you some uh, optimism, and this presentation was meant to offer a um, roadmap that can uh, offer a solution to tackle climate change. Thank you so much for your attention. Um, Elisa, it was a great presentation. I know your strategy to avoid difficult questions from me in the audience was to have a longer <laughs> presentation, but I, I, um, I hope we'll have a, a, a little window to, 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 to discuss them, so I want to make sure we afford time for the other panelists in discussion. So um, I'll just kick off a uh, uh, great presentation. I mean, obviously, there is a cozy and bargain to be struck. Uh, to, um, the estimate of the benefits I found really compelling in your paper. And as you know, I wanted to interrogate even the uh, opportunity cost to in existing investment in coal calculated, which was already relatively low in your calculus, but it struck me that um, you have, um, as of 2020, 40% of existing uh, operating coal assets are more expensive to operate than to replace with greenfield renewable energy. By 2025, that's expected to be about 80%. And then it's very hard to imagine that any greenfield coal by 2025, if 80% of it um, is not even worth the OPEX, uh, is, is in the money. So it seems like the opportunity cost is very, very low when you have uh, every other possible investment to, to, to make your return. So I'm wondering if it's, if, how conservative is that? Um, and then the other thing that I want to interrogate is, why does this have to be an inter international deal? It seems like the benefits would probably even accrue, it's a bit of a cheeky question, but it would accrue within states as well. And so it, there's a pretty good argument, um, even for emerging economies, that um, while there are benefits outside, that there is benefit for them to do it themselves. Yeah, thank you for those excellent questions. So on the uh, cost side, we try to be conservative in the sense that we try to be on the high end. Uh, and on the benefit side, we try to be conservative in being on the low end so that we uh, get an estimate of a net gain that is most likely higher than what we uh, estimated. And indeed, for the opportunity cost of coal, you're absolutely right that, that in many cases, renewables are already sort of, even without government interference, more appealing. Um, and indeed, therefore, the cost side would be actually lo probably lower than what we estimate, which only reinforces our case that we're stupid if we leave so much money on the table. Um, so to your uh, second uh, question on the... Just uh, within state, I mean, the logic Oh, yes, is, absolutely, yes. So, I appreciate the value of talking yeah. about it as a collective effort. So, but, so, you know. so, you know, when we wrote this paper, our thinking really evolved because we started off, you know, focusing on this global deal and then we got revisions back and then this forced us to th think about the, the regional breakdown. And, you know, I indeed think it's going to be hard to get all the countries in the world to get on the table to strike a climate finance deal. But what is really uh, fantastic is that we've seen recently that, that actually, you know, what we're proposing here theoretically is possible in reality. And this is the Indonesian deal and the uh, South African deal. And these are two of the top nine uh, coal producing countries. So indeed, if, if, you can make sure carbon leakage remains limited, right? Which you can do if you provide financing for renewables conditional on the commitment to uh, face that call. And you ensure, by the way, Tom's point, enforcement. Then you don't have to rely on a global deal and you can move in blocks. And this seems to be the most promising way forward. And indeed, Patrick Bolton and I, uh, tomorrow will uh, start writing a case study on the Indonesian deal, talking about your question about pricing debt, because we have all the data to, you know, break that down in detail. And then we are going to focus on uh, China and on, on the other ones. So we want to make this a reality. Like the lowest hanging fruit to make progress on tackling climate change is getting rid of coal. And indeed, in the final communication, of COP27, you know, hopefully it will not just be focused on phasing out fossil fuels. The focus has to stay on phasing out coal ASAP. It's low-hanging fruit. The benefits are huge. We can do it and we should do it. Thank you. Um, uh, probably two questions. Um, Alex, I see your hand up. For the sake of time, I just want to uh, project. Thank you. Um, Alex, Oxford University. Uh, as you know, Alyssa, I have a million questions about this, but I'll restrict myself to one. Um, it's on, on substitutability of coal for renewables. And I know that you've thought about this, um, but for a good chunk of the coal that you're describing, it cannot be 
substituted directly with electricity. And there may be intermediate processes, such as the production of green hydrogen and so on, that will increase the amount of renewable build-out that you ultimately need to replace that coal. And in a lot of cases, it's not technically possible or viable yet. So I just wonder how that features in this analysis, if at all, and um, how you might consider it in future work. Just very briefly on the Indonesia case, this is a very interesting one, but a lot of the coal that's supposed to be phased out under the deal is financed by China. 90% of that is uh, protected under specific contracts by which um, Chinese debt holders would have to be compensated probably to more of the value than the coal plant. And that's obviously in the detail, but um, that's something that this deal does not really address yet. So. Yeah, thank you for those uh, two great questions. At least a quick, quick answer. Yes, yes, Thanks. yes. Um, so first, as you saw, the scenario for phasing out coal is gradual. So you would start with phasing out coal in the electricity sector, which is totally possible in the power sector. And then you get to harder to abate sectors. And indeed, in our paper, and you can read the details, we uh, argue that you should build renewables, uh, uh, sorry, storage as well, both short-term, which is the ion batteries, but also long-term storage, which is indeed green hydrogen. And we actually model that. So, so the point is that, that over time, you need to get a greater electrification of the uh, economy. And for you know, certain processes, you probably need to rely on green hydrogen, which is part of the model. Uh, again, happy to talk more. Um, then second, on the Indonesian deal, I am not saying that this deal is perfect. I'm saying that the broad brush strokes are fully in line with what we propose. Blended finance, uh, conditionality, uh, helping to face it called replace with renewable. So that's all fine. The reason why we're going to write this case study is to say, how does what they actually do compare with what we argue ought to be done based on the most granular data that, that, it, that we have? So, so we're going to hopefully provide an ideal blueprint compared to what's actually being done. So um, thank you for your question again. Um. I'm going to suggest we switch and circle back if there's time. Um, uh, if you guys are feeling really generous, we may even cut five minutes into lunch, but I know that's a big thing to ask. So, um, so um, we will move next uh, to, uh, I think we're going to do Carol next. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Yes, oh, oh, you have it? Oh, sorry. If it's, yeah, it's well, queued well, up. No, go ahead. Yeah. Right, just, um, that's great. It's still four, not really. I just had my notes. Um, <laughs> okay. Oh, great. Cool. OK, so um, I'm going to talk about something very different, namely not um, the generation uh, of energy, but how firms are using energy and how we can help firms, either by giving them better access to finance or by helping them to become better managed in the way they actually um, use um, um, inputs and um, uh, reduce polluting uh, outputs. So uh, by way of introduction, this is a picture of total CO2 emissions and how they will have to be reduced uh, in the next three decades, really. Um, so as you can see, the main thing that I would like, to, um, like you to focus on here is that the reduction in CO2 emissions per capita will be um, much higher in, um, in advanced economies, but twice as high as uh, compared to emerging markets in developing countries. If we look at um, the same picture, but now more in, uh, we focus on aggregate numbers, then we can see that in absolute numbers, um, because the population in many emerging markets is very large, the challenge will actually be much larger in, uh, in, many, uh, in that part of the world. Right? So in poorer countries, many people, and even though per capita they um, are emitting less CO2, the total challenge um, will, be, will be very high. So it's important to make sure that um, we help firms in those countries um, to implement technologies that will make them more efficient, more energy efficient uh, producers. Now, why is this important? Well, one reason is that, in particular, in the first part of the green transition, a big chunk of total emission reductions can actually come from energy efficiency savings. Okay? Um, and so to get there, there are two, currently two problems. One is the problem of missing technology. So we know that in the scenario for the next couple of decades, um, a, a large number of assumptions are being built in on new technologies um, that, are still, that, still have to be the, that still have to be developed. Right? So we are counting on uh, that these technologies will become available in the next couple of years or maybe in two or, two or three decades, but they are not here yet. So that's a big um, uncertainty. But also for the technologies that have already been developed and that have mostly been developed in the West, 
we know that there's a second issue, and that is the diffusion, the very slow diffusion of those technologies, in particular, many, uh, in particular to many um, emerging markets. Uh, and that um, slow adoption of green tech by firms, or by more, of more energy efficient technology by firms, is really slowing down the green uh, transition in those, uh, in those countries. And so in recent work with uh, Ralph Martin and Mirabel Mules at Imperial and my colleague um, Helena Schweiger at EBD, we tried to understand at a very basic level what is actually, at the firm level, what is actually keeping firms back from investing more in energy saving technologies that um, in many cases at the micro level uh, could also provide a free lunch, um, similar to what we've just heard at the, um, at the global, uh, global level. So one thing that we did when we started out with this project is uh, basically go to firms, go to firm managers, uh, and ask them exactly this question. So we have a sample of about 11,000 firms in 20 countries, over 20 countries, that I will tell you more about in a second. And so we hired surveyors to go to these firms, ask them a lot of questions. We did it together with the World Bank and the European Investment Bank, um, and tried to understand what is really keeping them from investing in newer or upgraded technologies that really would make them more energy efficient producers. And so my best guess at the time that we started doing this survey is that a lot of firms would actually tell us that they would not have enough funding, either internal funding or access to external funding, to implement those technologies. Right? So there may be strong financial or credit constraints that is really keeping them back from uh, introducing these technologies. Now, when we looked at the result, this was not the case. This, um, as you can see here, that the lack of financial resources is actually mentioned by uh, a minority of firms. But the main answer that, we, that was returned to us is basically, well, we don't have the time for it. There are so many things that we have to, to do. And in particular, remember, this is an emerging market. These were emerging European emerging countries. So there's a lot of things that are going on at the same time. It's very dynamic. Firm managers have to focus on many different things and sort of also focusing on green issues or climate change issues or uh, issues related to the reduction of pollution or the reduction of CO2 emissions of their activities is often seen as important, but it just doesn't make it to uh, top priority. And so in the end, firms are not investing in um, these new technologies, even if they have the finance um, to do it. So that was a quite striking um, finding, in particular for a uh, developing a country bank as the one uh, where I'm working, so an international development bank. But of course, the main product that we sell to our countries of operation are, in many cases, um, credit lines in order to uh, reduce credit constraints at the firm level. So apparently, that is, in many cases, not enough. There's something else that's missing. So to try to understand uh, in a bit more detail what's going on, we uh, use the data that I just mentioned. And again, these were collected together with the European Investment Bank um, and the World Bank. Um, and we're going to basically try to understand in a bit more detail why these firms are actually keeping back in terms of making these green investments. So basically try to understand what's really behind that um, uh, picture that I just um, showed you. So th the nice thing about this survey is that uh, we talked to each of these firm managers for about one and a half hours. We asked them loads of questions. We have a lot of information about these firms and on you know, what they are engaged in, what type of activities they do. Um, but we also have a green economy module which contains a lot of very detailed questions about how they invest or not invest in green technologies, what type of technologies they actually invest in. But we also have a lot of information on the management practices of these firms, their management practices in general, and their green management practices in particular. And then we also know, again, using a number of um, standard questions, to what extent these firms have problems with accessing external finance. So we know whether they are credit constrained or not. Um, importantly, we know, also know exactly where these firms are located, and that will be important later on um, when I'm going to talk a little bit about the, um, the identification strategy that we use in the paper. We're going to supplement these data with an additional data set on um, um, industrial facilities from the EPRTR, European um, Pollution Release and Transfer Registry, um, which has additional information, again, at the firm level. Uh, and the advantage of these uh, data is that we also have very good information on the amount of pollution and the type of pollution that each of these firms is actually emitting. Uh, and finally, we have data on the banks across those countries. Again, that's useful, as I will explain in a second, for the, um, the strategy that we follow um, in the paper. So the main part of, um, of the paper is really to measure at the firm level how good firms are actually at um, dealing with environmental and climate change issues. And what we show in the, in the background research is that even within specific sectors and even within individual countries, there's huge variation in how well um, firms are dealing with these issues, how much they, uh, they're actually actively 
trying to reduce the amount of pollution and particularly the amount of CO2 emissions that they emit. So we're asking a bunch of questions to each of these firm managers uh, in four key areas. So whether they have uh, really explicit strategic objectives um, that are specifically about, about how the firm should or should not influence the environment and climate change. We see whether there's a manager that is explicitly responsible for green and environmental issues and also who that manager re reports to. We have information on um, the targets, if there are any, in terms of, again, emissions and other kinds of uh, pollution and waste that the firm produce. And very importantly, we also measure very specifically to what extent each of these firms is actually monitoring whether they are achieving those targets or not. Then we take all of that information, uh, create an index at the firm level or a z-score, and if I plot the distribution of the whole sample, you get something like this. So the main takeaway here is basically that in the sample as a whole, again, this is a sample of about 11,000 firms across 22 countries, we see that there's a thin tail of very well-managed firms. So these, manage, these firms have explicit, an explicit green mandate. They have a manager that is responsible for making sure that the firm sticks to that mandate. They target specific emissions, and they also really monitor whether they're actually um, getting closer to the target or not. But there's also a large bulk of firms that only does a few of these things or does none of these things, right? And so there's this big group of lagging firms. Now, interestingly, if you look at, as I just mentioned, if you look at the individual countries or individual industries, you find that same very skewed pattern. So again, even within industries and even within countries, there's a large group of lagging firms and a small firms of leaders that are actually the green leaders in that specific country or in that specific uh, industry. And so one of the challenges in the next couple of years will be to move more and more firms out of that big bulk on the left of these charts and you know, move them to the right-hand tail of these uh, charts by making them better um, uh, green managers, um, if you will. Now, importantly, if you compare it, to, compare it to how these firms are managed in general, there is a positive correlation between green management and general management but these concepts are actually quite distinct. Right? So we see that some firms are actually very well managed in general terms, and maybe we can speak a bit more about that later on, but in terms of green management, they may, they may still be performing um, quite poorly. And this is just to show that even within countries, there's quite a bit of variation in, um, in the quality of these management um, practices. Now, that's one part of um, the story that we're interested in. What we're mainly interested in is, of course, why are certain firms investing in new green technologies or new energy-saving technologies, whereas other firms are not. Um, to answer the question, we obviously need to have good data on the exact um, investments that each of these firms is making. And so we do that by collecting information on these seven main um, technologies. And we ask firms whether they have been investing in any of these or several of these, and if so, which ones, over the past three years. So that gives us a really good idea of the investment behavior of these firms in the green area. Uh, in the recent past. And that what we want to do is basically very simple. Um, we're going to relate in a, you know, almost naive way. On the left-hand side, we're going to put these green investments or the amount of green investments or whether they make at least one of these green investments in the past three years. We're going to have a bunch of control variables on the right. And then we're going to explain that by whether these firms are credit constrained or not and by the quality of their firm management. Now, you can, of course, come up with all kinds of stories why um, ju just running a simpler or less regression here is not going to get you at a causal interpretation. There may be reverse causality. There may be other, um, um, there may be other driving forces that are directly influencing both green investment as well as the quality of green management or credit constraints. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to come up with an instrumentation strategy that I don't have the time for to go in a lot of detail today. But the main thing what we do is we're basically going to use the fact that we know uh, very precisely which banks are surrounding each of these firms in our data set. And so we're going to make use of the fact that during the period that we study, a lot of these banks have been shocked by the global financial crisis, but to very different extents. So what this means is that firms that are located or that are surrounded by bank branches, owned by banks, that were heavily affected by the global financial crisis and that really had to ramp up their equity capital in the years after the global financial crisis. And one way of doing that was actually by reducing credit a lot. These are the firms that will have less access to um, external financing or much more less, ex less, as uh, less um, access um, to external financing than firms that are located close to branches that actually had, you know, continue to have good access 
um, to capital themselves. And so by using that variation that is predetermined, we are actually going to um, come up with an exogenous component uh, of credit constraints that will then allow us um, to say something more in a causal sense about the impact of credit constraints on green investment uh, by firms. We have a similar strategy uh, to instrument the, um, the management quality um, at the firm level as well. And so more details are in the, are in the paper. So, so basically, the, um, the, um, the results from our regression framework are, are sort of summarized in this picture. And the bigger takeaway here is that credit constraints do matter. We see that firms that are credit constrained are actually less likely to invest, but they're only less likely to invest in certain very particular types of green investments, namely those investments that actually are embedded in large capital expenditures. And that's perhaps exactly what we would expect. Now, if we look at the quality of green management, we see that that is a much more important in a quantitative sense um, factor, but it's also a factor that really matters a lot across the board. So even in those cases, in those types of investments, such as investments in better lightning or, or uh, in better waste management that are not very uh, capital intensive, we still see that the quality of the management at the firm level is a very important determinant of whether a firm is going to implement that or whether a firm is not going to implement any of these investments. In the second part of the paper, we're also going to see whether this has an impact on the emissions of these firms, uh, which is, of course, the, um, the outcome that we're ultimately interested in, not so much the intermediate outcome of firm investment. And so what we show is that these impacts are, are there and that they are quantitatively, quantitatively um, quite important um, as well. So let me stop here uh, and maybe talk a little bit about a few policy implications that, um, that I think are important or that at least are important to discuss. Um, one issue, I think, and this is particularly important for development institutions or international financial institutions like the one that I work for, is that we should perhaps look less at finance only or the availability of finance only or particularly the availability of credit only, but also look at the managerial capacity of the firms that we lend, lend to or invest in. Uh, for instance, um, increasingly we see that international financial institutions, development banks, are actually providing credit lines to, uh, green credit lines um, to banks. These banks are then on, on lending that credit to small firms and medium-sized firms that want to invest in new and green technologies. And often the uptake of those products is very low. So our results would suggest that the, the fact that a lot of the firms um, that are not well managed are actually not interested in any of these investments, so they are not going to a bank to apply for any of these for any of these loans. So you know, directly helping firms to actually give them more information about the technologies that are out there may actually be very important, uh, and you know, maybe important to combine that with the loosening of these uh, financial constraints. So another t um, key, um, key uh, takeaway could be that you know, just teaching firms to be better managed can be very important. And we know from a lot of experimental research that actually good management is something that can be durably taught. Uh, we know from experiments in India, for instance, in the textile industry, that when um, management consultants came in, tried to make firms, to help firms become better managed, that there were tangible benefits of that. And more importantly, that these benefits actually lasted several years. Uh, and so even when research teams would come back to these firms a couple of years later, we would see um, positive impacts, smaller impacts, but still positive impacts on the productivity of those firms. So it would be very interesting to see to what extent that can also be done in terms of improving the green management quality um, of firms. As far as I know, there's little um, empirical or um, um, in particular not any um, experimental evidence on that. And then the final point is an obvious one, but at the same time the most important one, um, and the, 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 that point is basically that, you know, of course, regulation and incentives should be aligned with improving the green management quality of firms. So in an environment like we still see many emerging markets where there are rampant fuel subsidies out there, of course, it's not going to help firms to become better green managers if the, you know, the distortions in the economy are such that um, that really works against um, more efficient, more energy efficient production um, in general. So I'll stop here and happy to take um, any questions? Thank you. I'll have a few, but time is tight, so we'll open it up first um, and see if, if folks in the audience have, have a few questions. Um, so um, while people are thinking, um, if I understand correctly, 
uh, the, the effect of credit constraints are both that for some low carbon technologies, CapEx, they're CapEx intensive and therefore more sensitive to the cost of capital. Absolutely, yeah. financing. But that in other cases, you have changes that are not particularly capital intensive. And maybe that's caused by the lack of sort of green management expertise. Is that? They're, that's they're that's sort of correct. They're just yeah. misperceptions. There are mis misperceptions out there. There's also a lack of knowledge in general about which technologies to choose. So um, again, to go back to what I mentioned earlier in terms of these credit lines, um, so what, what we see on a day-to-day -day basis, what really helps is when you, you know, offer credit to a firm that is in principle willing to undertake an investment to make their production um, process more energy efficient, is to basically tell them, okay, well, you, we can finance this, here are five, here's a menu of five key technologies, or so five main types of machinery that you could basically buy uh, with the credit that we can provide in order to become a more e uh, efficient producer. So actually that step, giving them that uh, amount of information can already be very helpful. So it's a combination then of know-how and, and credit. Sure. Um, so one more follow-up question. Um, the effects that you have on this previous slide were material but modest and incremental. I wonder, in taking policy implications, here's my like cheeky question for you, um, how much this is um, uh, about um, the ability of firms to improve their management versus being replaced by firms with better management and much lower emissions. Cool. And in, in terms of taking a policy implication away, we'd have to kind of contend with how much those incremental changes to weekly managed firms will, will, will get us to a zero carbon economy by the middle of the century. Well, the, uh, absolutely. So, so I think, um, you know, what will happen as a, so, you know, these things are not necessarily mutually exclusive, right? So, so one thing, of course, what will happen if firms become better managed, if they become more energy efficient, but if this increase, increase in energy efficiency that it, uh, is really a free lunch, these would also become more productive um, firms, and they may drive other firms out of the market. Um, so this is something that we would expect to happen. And again, in, in case of the, um, the Indian study, to, uh, this is something that happened to some extent. Um, the broader issues, of course, that, that you know, there, there may be much more sweeping um, changes needed in the structure of the economy, not just in terms of you know, which firms are producing in a particular sector, but also in terms of which sectors are actually producing in the first place. Um, and I think this paper has very little to say about that. So I think that is also not so much about bank credit. I think banks are really good at taking technologies from, let's say, you know, um, the West and, and allowing firms to give them the financing that they um, need in order to implement those technologies. So I think banks are very good in sort of trying to boost that diffusion proce process of, ex of existing technologies. Uh, but I think the evidence out there is that banks are not particularly helpful in terms of financing new technologies. We need venture capital or private equity uh, or even just equity markets in general uh, in order to move economies to a new equilibrium. And indeed, public investment as well. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, OK, in the interest of I know that you guys had questions, more questions for Raphael, but you're also probably hungry. So I want to make sure that we tick along um, and have time for our bond spreads uh, paper. And yeah. so, uh, Carol, over to you. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for um, having me here. So I'll present uh, joint work with my colleague Ulf, also from the Frankfurt School of Finance and Management. And um, yeah, as already announced by, by the uh, our moderator, we'll be in this paper looking at corporate bonds or corporate bond spreads. So um, what is the background, the motivation? I mean, something probably don't have to really explain in this group here anymore. But of course, we know that um, Firms are polluting air, water, and soil and causing damages to the ecosystems, and this negatively affects third parties. They're generating externalities that we've like been talking about a lot in this panel already. And these costs that firms actually generate to society are quite substantial. So this rather old number, but um, in 2008, the 3,000 largest um, companies caused damages around 2.15 trillion US dollars. And... Um, in recent years, or actually these recent decades maybe already, there's been increased public awareness concerning these negative um, externalities that firms actually cause. Once caused by um, some environmental catastrophe that's, that happened, of course, the rising attention to climate change. The question is, why is this um, 
or why is this relevant for firms or why should firms care about that? Well, there's a lot of different channels that have been already analyzed in the literature how this can actually translate into, firm, into risk on the firm level. So these channels include, for example, that there might be reputational costs for firms that cause um, consumer behavior to, ta to change, to, for example, buy less of their products if um, information about a harmful behavior of this firm comes out. There we also can also be, on the other hand, changes in investor preferences uh, towards sustainability that can also then change the, the investment behavior of investors and then in the end affect the asset prices and capital costs of those firms. And because of that, not surprisingly, investors, both debt and equity investors, show an increasing interest in the environmental or climate performance and risk of firms. And there's been, uh, just naming a few here, actually, quite a lot of papers out there already that analyze this relationship between firms' environmental or climate impacts, for example, their emissions, and the effect on capital costs. And what at least most of the studies find is that there's a positive effect of capital costs. So if firms pollute more, this impacts or increases the capital costs and leads to lower firm values. What we do in this paper here, and we're not the very first that actually do this, but I mean, um, is to actually look at the role of climate and environmental policy. So um, our idea in a nutshell is actually, um, if you just imagine a situation where there's like no or very lenient regulation in place in a country, then firms can actually exploit environmental resources at very low or almost zero costs. If you look at the other case, if you have regulation in place, um, firms internalize at least some of these costs. Um, and if you combine the, the stringency of regulation with actually environmental externalities that firms actually cause, you would say that, okay, the larger a firm's environmental externalities, so the more a firm's pollutes, and the more stringent the regulation in place, the higher the costs of compliance and the firm's financial risk, right? So a very dirty firm in a highly regulated environment has high costs compared to well, like a, a very dirty firm in an environment in a country with almost no environmental regulation in place. So what we say here or argue is that the influence actually of a firm's environmental or climate impact on its capital costs should crucially depend on the stringency of, of environmental or climate policies. And our analysis actually consists of two parts. So in the first one, we look at it in a bit more general way. So about general climate and environmental policy stringency and how this affects this relationship between environmental or climate impacts and um, bond spreads. And in the second part that I won't present here in detail, um, but I just want to mention is we then look at a very specific climate regulation, the EU emission trading schemes, and compare the effect of the introduction of this regulation on regulated and non-regulated firms. But I mean, for brevity, I won't present this in detail today. So um, very simply, our um, empirical approach, so we um, estimate this following model of bond spreads um, following the uh, financial economics literature. So on the left-hand side, we have the bond spread as a, as a measure of, of firm risks. And what we actually do is we, on the right-hand side, we include a measure about the firm's environmental externalities, for example, the environmental damages or CO2 emissions, um, information about policy stringency in the country the firm is located in, and interact those terms. So this interaction of both variables is what we're interested in um, to see whether it is as we expect that the effect of externalities on the firm's risks increases with policy, uh, policy stringency in this country. And then we include a lot of bond and firm-specific controls following the literature here. Um, just a brief idea about the data. So as measures of environmental externality of, of firms, you use data from true costs. First, we have a measure of direct environmental costs. So this is an estimate of um, in US dollars of all the environmental damages caused by a firm itself. And we look at scope one emissions, both measures and intensity, so relative to, to firm revenues. In the paper, we also look at scope two, scope three emissions, and indirect costs, what I won't present in detail here. Then we have um, two 
quite different measures of policy stringency. So once we use um, the uh, environmental policy stringency index of the OECD, which is actually based on policy instruments in place in countries, and another one, um, the climate policy stringency index of uh, German Watch, this is like a German NGO that has been recently also used in studies here and there, which is from the setup completely different, it's a very subjective one. So they, this one is based on surveys of experts in each country about the stringency of policies there. And then, yeah, we have um, other variables that we include, as I said, bond and, bond and firm level controls from different sources. And we look at, uh, as you saw the slide before, at the European or EU corporate bond market until 2012 for now, we stop stopping that here because um, this is when the EU ETS phase two stops, which we initially wanted to, to analyze. So um, here, here are the main results. So um, what you see on the left-hand side is um, the, the point estimates of our two variables, so environmental cost, environmental policy stringency, and the interaction term. So what you can see in the last row, the interaction term is positive. So as expected, the effect of environmental externalities on um, the firm risk or the bond spread increases with policy stringency. And on the right-hand side, we've plotted that. So here you see the average marginal effect of environmental costs on, on bond spreads plotted for different level of this environmental policy stringency index going from zero to six. So this po positive interaction term is visualized there by this positive slope. So the higher the policy stringency, the larger gets the, the effect of environmental externalities on, on the bond spread. But interestingly, we also find a threshold, right? So on the right-hand side of the threshold, this effect is positive. So if we have a rather stringent policy, polluting more leads to higher firm risk and higher capital costs. On the other hand, on the left-hand side, we find the opposite. So if there's a very lenient or almost no regulation in place, environmental regulation, we we'll see the opposite, right? So if a firm pollutes more, it actually has lower firm risk or lower cost of, of debt capital, right? So you could argue that somehow the capital market rewards pollution or polluting behavior in an environment where no regulation is in place. And just almost... Uh, very briefly, almost the same picture, we find the same or very similar result when looking at scope one emissions compared to environmental um, uh, damages. And here we find also very similar results when we look at the alternative policy stringency me measure. So this climate policy stringency index. What you can maybe see here, one difference is the left picture is national climate policy and the one in the middle is international climate policy stringency where we see that national climate policies have a way larger or quantitatively larger effect on bond spread compared to international policies. Okay, so briefly the conclusions. So we find that climate and environmental policy stringency matters. If it's above a certain threshold, higher externalities lead to higher bond spreads. If it's below a certain threshold, larger externalities actually lead to smaller bond spreads. Um, this effect also differs across firms, something that I didn't show here in detail. So if you look at the very clean firms, an increase in policy stringency actually decreases bond spreads. So clean firms benefit from more stringent environmental policies. And for dirty firms, you see the opposite, higher stringency, higher firm risk, or higher bond spreads. For the introduction of the EU ETS, we find what I didn't present here that for regulated, regulated firms, we see an increase in the carbon premium. And for non-regulated firms, we find, depending on the uh, specification, no or even a negative effect. So they benefit from not being covered by this regulation, which somehow a bit captures also the point that Ralph just presented, that it's important to maybe extend this regulation across all sectors. So um, the key punchline, basically, I want to leave you with is that we argue that climate and environmental policy determines whether harmful firm behavior, pollution, is actually punished or rewarded by investors. Okay, thank you very much.
So there is lunch, and I will, if you are patient for a brief q and I will tell you where it is. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, just, uh, uh, Carol, a couple of really interesting implications I want to draw out and then, and then yeah. open the floor to one or two questions. Um, it, if I'm understanding correctly, what you have is a virtuous circle and a vicious circle happening at the yeah. same time. So um, the market rewards uh, clean actors in a clean game yeah. and, pun and rewards bad actors, dirty actors, in a dirty game. Yeah. And um, so that has a magnifying effect on the policy implications of an environmental policy, right? Because yeah. not only is it the direct emissions reductions from the policy, but you've also created the magnifying effect of lower cost financing for winners in, in, the, in the clean game. And in fact, the opposite in a dirty game. It magnifies the bad impacts of not having uh, environmental policy. Is that a right way to interpret the data? Is that Yeah, that's exactly. Um a right way to interpret it and the key point that we actually want to make, in particular in this situation um, of this negative versus circle, if you imagine you'd, you, if you don't have a regulation in place or a very lenient one, you have this direct negative effects of a socially too high level of externalities, but in addition those firms, you sub subsidize them. Cheaper capital. They have given cheaper capital, which if you think in a more dynamically about it, which we don't cover in, in our estimation, of course, this could lead to capital flows being redirected toward those dirty players, which could even magnify this more. Well, it certainly suggests there's another form of carbon leakage when you exempt industries, say, from an ETS, because yeah. you actually are creating more emissions in the exempted sectors because of their lower cost of capital by exempting them. So not only yeah. do they get to pollute, but they actually pollute more from, from the fact that they're exempted from the regime. So it's like yeah. additional leakage. You know? Yeah, you could argue yeah. that. Um, questions or comments from the audience? Hi, thanks for your presentation. That was quite interesting. Um, could you put into context what the, the, the marginal effects are in terms of other types of economic variables and in perhaps uh, the bond spreads? Uh, how important is it uh, in comparison to other variables? Um. That's actually a very good question. I would have to, I, I can't tell you now on the spot how large it is compared to um, other variables because I just don't have the, the numbers in the back of my mind. But I mean, it's at least the sizes that we find are similar to what previous studies have found looking at, um, at stocks and equity returns. So what we find here is um, given the average policy stringency they appear in a data set, I think, then like a, one standard deviation increase in, in emissions leads, I think, to 30 basis points higher capital costs. So, um, and I also, compared to what the, the mean is of the bond spreads, we also don't know in my mind, I know that this is a, I hope you just believe me <laughs> with this bad arguments, that, it, that it's quanti quantitatively meta. I remember that I've, Looked at it, but I can't tell you the numbers now. I hope, um, yeah, it should be in the paper somewhere. Other questions or, or comments? Probably well lunches. Yeah, there's one there. <laughs> All right, thank you. Um, in a way, your paper seems to be proving this argument that the, the system is rigged a little bit. Right, that companies are incentivized to externalize costs because it improves their profits. Investors are incentivized to look for companies with higher profits. So any company that's a heavy polluter is going to have a vested interest in making sure that the regulations will not stop them from being able to um, uh, continue to pollute or externalize those costs. So, you know, how do we, you know, what do you do from a policy perspective to change that equation? How do you incentivize the companies in some way so that it makes, it's, it's, it's better for them, you know, they have now a, some financial incentive not to pollute or, you know, so that would stop that behavior? Or can you stop them from influencing policy you know, we have, for example, in our country uh, here, we have uh, huge monies being spent by different lobbies to make sure mm -hmm. that 
environmental protections are rolled back or not put in place. So it becomes self-perpetuating. How do you? How does that influence your work? Yeah, may, maybe briefly about that. I mean, this is difficult to answer for me. Or we can't answer with our research how to keep companies from lobbying against these environmental regulations. But I mean, considering for um, the other part of your question about incentivizing uh, companies to actually reduce their emissions or their environmental impacts, I think the nice thing about our result is that it seems to be enough already providing quite a few incentives to just adjust or increase, extend environmental regulation, because then apparently somehow investors in the capital market replies to that by you know, adjusting the incentives for the firm. So there's like no need to maybe regulate as well on the capital market so some provide incentives. Just put like or provide a, an ambitious, um, a stringent environmental and climate policy and the capital market will push the firms in the correct direction. So I think this is a what nice result, I think. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's not a uniform direction. That's what's interesting yeah. about the study is that it's the, the market is going to just be an accelerant to whatever direction policymakers choose to take the economy. That's a little yeah. bit of a different conclusion than just, you know, less policy is rewarded uh, in, mm. you know, one uniform direction. So yeah. Kind of a neat, neat finding. Other questions? Um, okay, I've, I will share you with you that it is across <laughs> the building and upstairs. There's lunch provided, yeah. and you have... Um, 56 minutes, so appreciate the extra time. Another round of applause for our panelists. <laughs>